Hello, I'm Mark Wilson. I'm a consultant in respiratory and intensive care medicine at Royal Lancaster Infirmary. And this is the third in a series of three uh, respiratory lectures for MRCP part one. And I've chosen as the subject for this uh, uh, final lecture, um, lung neoplasia. So in the first question, it's a 58 year old man with a heavy previous asbestos exposure history, smokes 10 cigarettes a day and has done since he was 17 years, of, uh, years old. What is his increased risk of developing bronchial carcinoma compared to a lifelong non-smoker and never exposed to asbestos? And the answer here that his, his risk of development of lung cancer compared to a non-smoker who's not been exposed to asbestos is 50 times um, greater. Uh, and that's because it has a multiplicative effect uh, of the smoking risk times the asbestos, uh, the, uh, asbestos risk. He has approximately, you can work out, he smoked 10 cigarettes a day since the age of 17. He's now 58. He has a, approximately a, a 20 pack year history, he smoked 10 cigarettes for 40 years. So that gives him a, a, a risk of between 10 and 20 times uh, risk of lung cancer for somebody who's an, compared to someone who's a non-smoker. This demonstrates um, the relative mortalities. This is from a, a paper in, uh, or a supplement in CHEST 2003 looking at the epidemiology of lung cancer. And on the left side, you can see that the mortality uh, if you don't smoke and are you not being exposed to asbestos, the rate is 11.3 per 100,000 population. If you do smoke and you've not been exposed to asbestos, then it goes up by more than 10 times. And if you look at the multiplicative effect at the uh, model at the end, then if you do smoke and you've been exposed to asbestos, your risk is 50 times greater. A 65-year-old man has been attending the chest clinic for some years with a chronic lung condition. Unfortunately, he's also recently been diagnosed having lung cancer, and he wants to know if the two are linked. Which one of the following conditions has not been associated with increased risk of lung cancer? And the answer is asthma, at least not uh, directly from asthma, with no smoking history. There is an association, you're four to six times more likely to develop lung cancer if you have COPD. That's over and above that, given the smoking history. It's often difficult to tease out those diseases that are strongly associated with smoking anyway, as whether it's the disease per se, but there's certainly strong associations with these conditions. TB, slightly less of an association, but we certainly know inflammatory conditions um, can predispose to um, lung cancer. Pulmonary fibrosis has a strong association with lung cancer, so-called scar carcinoma that can arise, and there's often an adenocarcinoma. And alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, also similar to COPD. So, and in addition to that, other viruses, CMV, for example, or HIV, also associated with um, increased risk of lung cancer. So you shouldn't be taking membership if you didn't know that sm cigarette smoking is a risk factor for lung cancer. It's very, very significant. 90%, in fact, lung cancer was rare at the beginning of the 20th century um, and barely got a mention in some of the respiratory textbooks. Now it's, 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 it's the highest. Um, and 90% of lung cancers are linked to smoking with at least a 10 to 20 fold increase in, uh, in your risk if you smoke. And it's dose dependent. The more you smoke, the higher your risk is. In addition, other factors, cigars and pipes, you're probably are five to six times more likely to develop lung cancer than a non-smoker, less than cigarettes, obviously, but, but still significant. Marijuana, difficult, difficult to gauge, but certainly they've been shown to have some metaplastic changes in, in, in people that smoke marijuana on a regular basis. Similarly in cocaine, although the evidence, smoking cocaine, although the evidence is, is less available. And this just demonstrates um, the increased likelihood of you developing lung cancer. You can see in the never smokers what the mortality rate is. And then in, in those who smoke 20 cigarettes per day for 30, 40 years, or 40 cigarettes 30 to 40 years. So that's a 30 year pack year history, a 40 pack year history, and a 60 and an 80 pack year history. And you can see that the mortality rates increase and so therefore has a dose dependent effect. There are other risk factors, however. We know asbestos itself is a five to six fold increased risk of lung cancer. Some debate as to whether that's because of the fibrosis associated with asbestos, um, but probably asbestos per se has an increased risk. 
And then there's quite a number of others. So if you see a question, look for the occupational history, which can be very important, particularly if it's somebody who may be a non-smoker. But if they are a smoker, it's often additive to this at least. A 68-year-old lady has been diagnosed with a bronchial carcinoma. Which one of the following symptoms is she most likely to have presented with? The most likely is cough. Um, you actually might think, well, probably hemoptysis. It's quite a sinister symptom. But actually, the vast majority of patients who have a lung cancer pre pre present with something simple like a cough. To some extent, that makes sense. We don't have pain receptors in the lung. The way your lung tells you something's wrong is you cough. So when a cough uh, develops, becomes chronic, or in, uh, as a lot of our patients are smokers um, and will be coughing anyway, it often can be a change in the nature of their cough that makes them present to their GP, um, then subsequently lung cancer is diagnosed. And that's the relative frequency. We have cough at the top, weight loss, dyspnea is lower down than you might expect, um, chest pain, but obviously... Um, there won't be any pain if it's largely intrapulmonary, you only get chest pain if it might be a pleural effusion causing a pleural reaction or if there's um, uh, erosion through the chest wall. Um, and hemoptysis is a little bit lower down and then you see um, some of the others there associated. So which one of the following is the most common malignant lung tumour? So the most common is a squamous cell carcinoma of the bronchus. In children, actually, it's uh, secondary carcinomas, uh, and, uh, metastases that are the common, uh, that are the most common, as as you might expect. So that's the breakdown. We have non-small cell, and we group cancers into non-small cell versus small cell because there's differences in behaviour between small cell and non-small cell, and the differences in treatment and differences in staging. So we group non-small cell and small cell together, and the vast majority are non-small cell, of which the longest single um, um, tumour type is a squamous cell carcinoma. That's true of both smokers and non-smokers, although these are all rare in non-smokers, but nonetheless the most common is a squamous cell. I'm not going to talk very much about bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma, but I do think it is something that's worth reading for the membership because it can present slightly atypical to other tumours in that it might present with a cough which is productive of classically thin mucoid sputum because it's probably from goblet cells. It's certainly an adenocarcinoma, so there's mucus produ production. But it's slightly atypical in that if you, the imaging may just show some nodularity or may look like consolidation. So it might be other symptoms such as weight loss and the longevity of those changes and the strong smoking history that might indicate this is bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma. So that it can come up in, mem in membership, although I haven't included a question in that. Bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma is also associated with smoking, but it is it's slightly higher proportion of non-smokers. So it's, it's certainly associated with smoking, but more of non-smokers get more of bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma. Now, looking at other tumours from the lung, um, metastases to the lungs, well, your whole cardiac output goes through your lungs. So any tumour that's going to spread hematogenously will it has a risk of, of seeding into the lung and therefore causing metastases. And those are the commonest ones. And we'll largely, largely follow what are the commonest tumours. Um, and, and those are the commonest ones. But it's an interesting point that pulmonary metastases, how common it is, pulmonary metastases are present in 20 to 54% of all of those patients at, when they, at, at post-mortem and they die of cancer. Now, lung metastases, where do, they, where do lung primary lung metastasize to? And I was thinking of Ed Balls, who um, might disappear as a politician, I don't know, because it goes to your Ed, or your brain, or your balls, which is not testicles in this case, but is bone, adrenals, lung, liver, and skin, the, the commonest being the, the top five, essentially. So, so those are the areas at which you are likely to have lung metastases. Question 5, a 65-year-old woman was diagnosed as having lung cancer. Which one of the following statements is most appropriate? And the answer is hypercalcemia 
may occur without bone metastasis. Now, that's quite an important fact to know, as we'll, as we'll subsequently see in other questions, why that would be important. But looking at some of the facts around cancers, HPOA, which is a painful swelling in the ankles, knees and wrists caused by a periosteal reaction, is often associated most often with adenocarcinoma, less frequently with squamous cell carcinoma, and rarely with small cell carcinoma. It's predominantly non-small cell and predominantly adeno. SIADH is commonly seen in, it can be seen in a number of tumours and in pneumonias, but it's commonly seen in small cell carcinoma, not in squamous cell. Paraneoplastic syndromes occur more commonly with squamous cell, or they occur more commonly with small cell. And hypercalcemia associated with bone metastasis is best treated with IV steroids. Steroids may have a role in hypercalcemia in some causes, but generally it will be fluids and bisphosphonates. Question six, which one of the following is most characteristic of a small cell bronchial carcinoma? And the answer is the paraneoplastic phenomena often occur in the absence of metastases. If you have a paraneoplastic phenomena from a small cell, 70% of them will still have what we call limited stage. And we'll have a look at the staging as well later. Um, and have not actually metastasized. They're paraneoplastic because they're not metastatic related. They don't have to have metastases. History of prior asbestos exposure is usually obtained, much more likely in an adenocarcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma. It's, it's slightly bigger than lymphocytes and it comes from, and small cell comes from neuroendocrine origin and they are, they are small cells or oat cells as they used to be called. It, does, it has a very poor prognosis, probably the worst prognosis of, prognosis of, the, of the lung cancers and it's very rare that, you would, that surgery would be an indicated treatment. Uh, partly because the vast majority of the time patients have already metastasized by the time you make the diagnosis. And that just demonstrates it. If you want to choose to have a lung cancer, and you have to, don't choose a small cell. If you have a look at the doubling time there, that tells you how many days it doubles in size. You can see that it's much more rapid in small cell. It doubles in time in, in uh, you know, around about a month it will have doubled in size. It's very rapid, very aggressive tumor. The others are slower, particularly adenocarcinoma, which, we cannot, which can often be quite well differentiated uh, and has a slower um, uh, doubling time. Now, look at, I've, I've taken some facts, uh, key facts that might alert you and give you some clues as to what the diagnosis, histological diagnosis is if you're giving, given a potted history. So, for example, a squamous cell carcinoma, clues might be it's, it's more likely that they can all cavitate, but it's the most likely to show cavitation on a chest X-ray in a squamous cell carcinoma. It's more likely to have hypercalcemia. Now, the hypercalcemia may be related to bone metastases, but also can be re related to parathyroid hormone-related uh, protein or calcitriol secretion. So that's, almost, that's a paraneoplastic and not necessarily because of metastatic disease, which has importance when you come to decide treatment in the, in the future and can often be associated with a leukocytosis. Adenocarcinoma, clues as to the diagnosis before histology, more likely to be peripheral, um, and, and are associated with HPOA, as, as we've seen. So, um, it, which is periosteal proliferation of the tubular bones, which we'll see, associated with clubbing. And also more associated with dermatomyositis, so a heliotropic rash uh, under the eyes, um, Gotrin's pap papules on the backs of your hands, is, is also associated with a lot of adenocarcinomas, of which lung is a major one. So this is an example you can just see on the x-ray on your left as you look at the screen and in the right upper zone on that chest x-ray you can see a small peripheral lesion which is an adenocarcinoma in this case and it's more likely to be peripheral. And you can see some periosteal reaction in the bottom here of the ankles um, uh, in the mid shaft there of the long bone um, showing some uh, which, is, which is HPOA. Small cell carcinoma is quite interesting as far as membership is concerned because it can present in lots of different ways and often with its paraneoplastic neurological phenomena. So watch out for those or watch out for the patient who's losing weight and they give you a blood test which shows a very low sodium and, is, and she happens to be a smoker. So clues that this could be a small cell carcinoma. Um, so SIADH Cushing, Cushing syndrome. 
lots of neurology, particularly brainstem neurology. In particular, watch out for patients presenting with a Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, similar to myasthenia gravis in, the, in that it causes progressive muscle weakness, but it's differentiated from myasthenia um, because it, it has less ocular and cranial nerve involvement, more autonomic um, uh, dysfunction than myasthenia gravis, and it improves with activity rather than the classic myasthenia which, which um, worsens with activity, of course, which we use as a challenge. The, why these are important is they're often the presenting features, and then the hunt is on for the small cell carcinoma, which may actually be, be very small. And they often have limited stage disease on onset of paraneoplastic. By limited stage for small cell means it's limited to one hemithorax. It's limited to one lung. There's only two stages in small cell because it's so rapid and aggressive. It's either limited where it's limited to one lung or it's extensive. It's gone somewhere else. There's only, there are only two stages. A 30-year-old woman with a non-smoker comes to clinic with a one-year history of a dry cough and haemoptysis. X-ray shows a chest X-ray shows a small lesion, the origin of the right lower lobe bronchus. CT scan confirms this and is otherwise normal. You perform the bronchoscopy and you see a smooth red tumour. Which one of the following would you do next? This is a two-stage question, really. One, you have to work out what the diagnosis is, and then from that, that will give you the answers to what your management should be. Now, the clues really is that this is a young woman who's a non-smoker. So the likelihood of this being a malignant tumour is low, very low indeed. She's got a dry cough that's been going on for a while and she's had hemoptysis. And classically, when you do the bronchoscopy, it shows a smooth red tumour. These are all classical of, of carcinoid, of bronchial carcinoid. It's a very smooth red, called cherry red spot, which looks very vascular. And it is very vascular. So the safest option, if you see it, is it needs removal. It's curable once it's removed. The safest option is to do it surgically and remove it surgically with as limited excision as possible. Generally, the advice is not to biopsy the tumour because it's very vascular and can bleed quite a lot. Now, that's not always true. A lot of people will actually biopsy the tumour, um, uh, and particularly if you put some adrenaline onto it. But the safest option from these and officially, I would say, you discuss it with a, with a, with a view to surgery. Um, in a young woman, you, this lady uh, with, a, with what looks like carcinoid, she's going to go for surgery. Um, go for surgery is the safest option, uh, rather than biopsying and then causing lots of blood. The others would not be appropriate once you've established that there is a, a problem here that looks like carcinoid. So that's a picture of it. You can just see the sort of shiny vascular appearance um, sat in the main bronchus there of a carcinoid. And you do get the impression if you put a needle anywhere near that, um, it might just bleed quite a lot. It has that appearance. You can take a brush and just wash, but it doesn't have, obviously, as, di as, as high a diagnostic yield as, as would a biopsy. So what is bronchial carcinoid? It's a good one for membership exams because it's relatively rare and lots of rare questions come up. If you know a bit about bronchial carcinoid, it's also an easy one. It appears as a cherry red spot, as we've said. It's very similar to small cell, but it's benign in that it has a neuroendocrine origin from the so-called APUD cells, or amine precursor uptake and decarboxylase cells there. They have neuroactive amines, and hence the carcinoid syndrome, in particular serotonin. Classically, it's the Kulkitsky cell, which is good to remember for your membership. Very few bronchial carcinoids are associated with the carcinoid syndrome. That's also another potential question for membership. It's much less likely you have carcinoid syndrome because it produces less serotonin. And it has to be really quite large before you get carcinoid syndrome. And if you do get it, it's very atypical features, protracted um, sort of flushing, anxiety and tremor, hypersalivation, lots of atypical features compared to classical uh, carcinoid, classical GI origin carcinoid syndrome. And surgical resection is usually curative. They're often proximal and curative. 56-year-old man presents with a cough and a mass in the right upper lobe. 
which can be seen on the chest x-rays, otherwise fit and well, which one of the following will be your next investigation? And the answer is CT thorax. Of course, all of these may well be used at different stages for assessing um, operability and for, for staging the tu uh, a, a known tumour. But the first investigation you would do after a chest x-ray would be a CT of the thorax, which will help to stage the tumour. And probably before you do a bronchoscopy, because um, you want to know exactly where to go for your biopsy. Um, if, in fact, a bronchoscopy is indicated, it could be a CT-guided biopsy would be the next stage. MRI can be useful at looking at whether, the, at whether there is invasion into major structures. PET scan, of course, for staging. And spirometry in terms of trying to assess a patient for their operability. If it's staged as being operable, then are they fit for surgery is the next question. So this slide just shows the, uh, the algorithm in the NICE guidelines of 2005 for further investigation of, uh, of, of lung cancer. And of course, there are symptoms and signs which will highlight the need for a chest x-ray. And if this is suspicious for a lung cancer and a, ref a referral to a chest physician and the next investigation as recommended is a CT scan of the thorax before progressing on to a bronchoscopy. Question 9, a 50-year-old man with 20-pack year smoking history presents with hemoptysis and a 3 centimetre right upper lobe mass on his chest x-ray. Bronchoscopy shown in the squamous cell. CT has confirmed the mass and shows enlarged 1 centimetre short axis hyalur and paratracheal nodes and he's discussed the lung cancer MDT. What are they likely to think is the most appropriate next course of management? The answer here is to refer for a, a PET scan. What you have here is a gentleman who's otherwise fit. Um, he has clearly a squamous cell carcinoma, but it appears as though it may be operable. And the only problem is he does seem to have some paratracheal nodes, and perhaps you need, therefore, to clarify the node status um, elsewhere to restage to see if this patient is going to be uh, operable. And so you wouldn't automatically, therefore, certainly if he's being considered for curative therapy, then referring for chemotherapy or radiotherapy at this stage is not uh, the best step for him and, and not referral to the palliative care team is, the best, is not the best step. Immediately re referring for surgical resection may mean that you have not quite clarified if the CT scan is giving you the whole picture. So what you want to do is do a PET scan to have a look at that. Now, a PET scan is, is positive emission um, tomography. Essentially, patients are given a radio-labeled glucose solution intravenously, and, which is taken up by any tissue that is avidly replicating. And therefore, brain often takes it up because brain, uh, brain um, uh, obviously utilizes glucose, uh, but also something that has an avid high turnover. So something that is malignant will show up as a hot spot in a PET scan. And what we're really looking for is, is that a malignant tumour and is there, any, is there any distal spread, particularly to nodes or elsewhere. Uh, now, obviously, inflammatory conditions can show up on a PET scan as well, um, but, but will not be as bright often as a malignancy. And this just, again, confirms this nice guidelines, again, for staging, uh, 2005, that if the chest scan, the CT scan suggests this patient may be a candidate for surgery, progress for, to a PET scan to ensure that there is no clear malignant lymphadenopathy or distal spread that may not have been clearly visualised on a CT scan. Of course, CT scan may just show enlarged nodes. It doesn't show whether they're malignant enlarged nodes necessarily. 50-year-old smoker was diagnosed with non-small cell carcinoma. That's the size of the tumour. It's in the left lower lobe, uh, but it has invaded the visceral uh, pleura. The ipsilateral hyalur lymph node is also involved, and there's no metastatic involvement of any distal organ. Which of the following is the stage of the disease in this patient? This is the, I think this is quite a difficult question because it, it relies on you having a pretty good knowledge of TNM staging for quite a lot of tumours. I think lung cancer being very common, though, in, in defence of this question, with lung cancer being very common, it's reasonable to have an idea of TNM staging for the very common uh, cancers, although often this might be specialty rather than a general knowledge. 
Um, just a forewarning as well that the TNM staging uh, and what I'm going to show you of the TNM staging is old now in that it changed about 12 months ago. Now that might not yet be reflected in future questions and a lot of the extremes of the TNM have stayed very much the same. So at least knowing the extremes of the staging. In this case, because it's greater than three centimetres in size, but it's not invading a major structure or pushing up against the major structure, it'll be T2, and I'll show you the staging. Because it's ipsilateral hyla, it's, it's staged at N1, and there are no metastases, so it's M0. So the answer is C. Now, this is a bit difficult to see. But this is the t a summary of the TNM staging, and I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. T is just what, how big is the tumour and where is it? That's all it means. T1 and T2 goes with size. It's greater than or smaller than three centimetres. T3 means it's pressing against the major structure, perhaps the mediastinum or the, or the long edge. Uh, or the long edge. T4 usually means it's invaded. And so T4 usually means inoperable. Much easier is the nodal staging. N0, there are no lymph nodes. N1, it's on the same side as the tumour. N2, it's gone to the centre. N3, it's gone somewhere else. Much easier. M, M, M staging, even easier. You've either got metastases or not. It's zero or one. And that's the, st that's the um, TNM staging. But that can be staged to help us with whether to, to, to see whether this patient can have curative therapy. And, and this is essentially a summary of that, where stage one is generally a T2 with no lymph nodes to the center, in other words, N0 or N1 nodes. That's curable. Once it goes to N2, it's becoming incurable. It's gone into a central area that means it's gone beyond the lung, which means it's distally spread. So N2 generally not. So if you've got stage one, stage two, as is summarized down the bottom here, T1, T2, N0 or N1, then this is operable. If, however, you've gone on to stage three, you are running into N2 nodes, you've got nodal spread elsewhere. So this is unlikely at stage three to be curable, and in the vast majority isn't curable. And stage four, of course, means it's gone elsewhere, and that means it's not curable. So stage one and two may be operable, stage three and four is not. Unfortunately, most of our patients present at stage three and four. A 62-year-old man with a heavy smoking history presents with a mass. Which one of the following clinical features might still permit curative surgical resection for bronchial carcinoma? And the answer here is the hypercalcemia. And if we go back to what we said earlier about why patients get hypercalcemia, it's not necessarily because of metastatic bone disease. It can be paraneoplastic. Paraneoplastic means it can potentially still be curative. The others would would be a contraindication. A malignant pleural effusion means it's spread to pleura. It would be inoperable. Invasion of the superior vena cava would be a T4 because it's major invasion. S Some questions say a superior vena cava obstruction alone. That doesn't preclude surgery because a T3 may be just pressing up against the superior vena cava but not directly invas invading. So that doesn't nest, not a definite contraindication to surgery, but if there's invasion, it's T4. An FVC of less than 1.2 pre-op, we'll come back to that. Uh, left recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy means there's been mediastinal invasion and therefore is inoperable. Now an FVC, well an FUV1 of around 1.2 to 1.5 maybe, but an FVC means they have very low lung volumes. And therefore, attempting sur surgery here would not be possible, not because of the stage of the tumour, but because the patient would be made much worse afterwards and may not survive. So in addition to the staging of the tumour, you have to look at the patient and decide, could the patient take surgery? What would they be like afterwards? And these are the BTS guidelines in 2001, which again are about to be changed. But if you're looking at lobectomy, you need an FV1 of at least 1.5 or more in order for you not to be made worse by surgery in terms of uh, quality of life and breathlessness and survival. And if a pneumonectomy, you need an FEV1 of more than two. And there may be some gray areas there, so to help, sometimes we look at the transfer factor. So the second arm is a transfer factor of greater than 40%, comes with an average risk. But the transfer factor we've discussed, less than 40% comes with a high risk. 
If you really want to stage them further, we do exercise tests. So essentially, there's those two arms to the management. And those are the figures you ought to remember as things stand at the moment for the membership. A 78-year-old man who worked as a plumber presents with a unilateral pleural effusion. He's felt unwell for some time. He spends much of his day sitting in the chair. Pleural biopsies taken a thoracoscopy have shown malignant mesothelioma. You've explained the diagnosis to him. What would be the most appropriate treatment to consider next? And the only real treatment option available at the moment, particularly in an elderly, otherwise unwell man, would be radiotherapy to the thoracoscopy tract site to stop seeding along the investigative site. So, or palliative radiotherapy if the mesothelioma is eroding through the chest wall and causing pain. There is no curative attempt here. You'll see that other forms of treatment have been tried in mesothelioma, but have not shown good mortality benefit, if any. And often it require major intervention and major surgery and could not even be contemplated in somebody elderly and otherwise unwell. So it's own and, uh, and, uh, and is unlikely to result in, a, in a, a good outcome. Mesothelioma, primary pleural tumour almost exclusively related to asbestos and has a terrible prognosis and is a very aggressive tumour and at the moment with no good treatment. So often it's palliative or preventive of further seeding as in this case. A 48-year-old mechanic presented to the clinic complaining of increased shortness of breath, no symptoms of cough. He smokes 20 to 25 cigarettes per day and two cans of beer every day. His brother recently died of stomach cancer and he now has a, he has a large uh, left-sided pleural effusion. Now it describes the effusion as a white fluid, no clear supernatant after centrifugation, cholesterol crystals were detected. What is the probable cause of the effusion? And the most likely diagnosis, although a number of those would be reasonable, the most likely diagnosis is lymphoma. What's being described there, milky white fluid that doesn't clear on centrifugation, is chylothorax. So it's from thoracic duct, probably, or certainly lymphatics. And, and so what would cause that? Well, a lymphoma may, a metastatic stomach carcinoma may, uh, but there's no real history of that. He has a family history, but I think that's a red herring in this case. Lymphangioliomyomatosis is a disease of premenopausal women, and this is a man, so it's not going to be that as a diagnosis. Yellow nail syndrome is a benign condition which does cause a chylothorax, but there's no history in there of yellow nails, and he's an otherwise unwell man. And the most likely diagnosis and the other cause of a chylothorax, more commonly, is a lymphoma. So um, it's, this is likely the answer in this gentleman. So to finish on question 14, you referred a 68-year-old man who smokes 40 cigarettes a day, suffered a chronic cough, increasingly associated with, uh, uh, with hemoptysis. He has a dull ache on the left side of his chest. His chest x-ray reveals a left hyalur mass, suspicious of uh, bronchial carcinoma. You're considering radical radiotherapy in this man. Which one of the following is a relative contraindication to radical radiotherapy? The same considerations are given to radical radiotherapy as for surgery. It is often, although less, um, less good outcomes than surgery, it, it can be curative. And so therefore a malignant pleural effusion um, would suggest that this was not curative and is, in studies, related to poorer outcomes. There are, there are some guidelines that might suggest an FEV1 of less than 50% um, uh, radical radiotherapy shouldn't be carried out, but actually other studies have shown that some patients with, those level, with these levels of FEV1 actually have better lung function after the rate radical radiotherapy or better, sim uh, better in terms of symptoms. So that's not an absolute contraindication. So a relative contraindication would be something that was now certainly incurable and has lower, uh, less good outcomes, which would be a malignant pleural effusion. So the key points from, from uh, pulmonary neoplasia, um, it's not too difficult to read around this really, can be done relatively quickly. I've summarised a lot of the issues I think around questions, but do know the different tumour types 
and their different slight differences and subtleties of presentation that may give you a clue as to the underlying diagnosis, particularly looking at paraneoplastic syndromes, particularly looking at small cell uh, carcinoma, which can uh, present in a lot of different uh, uh, unusual ways. And unusual tumours are common in MRCP world, so read about bronchial carcinoid, have a look at bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma as well in terms of its presentation. And then how would you investigate? What are the investigations and how do you interpret those in terms of recommending further treatment, in particular surgery? Thanks very much.